what is an adventure? For me, an adventure is a course of action that invites risk. It's anything, any undertaking where the outcome, we don't know what it's going to be, we can't be certain of it. And I've always had a bit of a grow for adventure and that probably explains why I'm standing here today. <laughs> I couldn't say no to an exciting prospect and then I couldn't back out. <laughs> um, but I think that life is an, a, an important adventure. And I work now teaching here in UCD and I love working with students. They're on the cusp of their careers and their independent lives. They're brimming with potential. There's an ocean of possibilities in front of them. But I am often struck by how many are focused on getting that safe, secure, permanent job near home, preferring the illusion of security to the risk of adventure. And that gets me thinking about what's my role as a teacher in inspiring a spirit of adventure in students. Now, I grew up on a small farm and I grew up in a typical rural conservative home. I found this composition by my 10 year old self recently, setting out what I wanted to do when I left school. I wanted to be an astronaut and I wanted to be a ballerina, believe it or not. <laughs> now, the nearest I ever got to fulfilling those ambitions is a modest collection of medals for Irish dancing and skydiving from 10,000 feet for my 50th birthday. <laughs> but I love that small child for having big dreams. And I think that holding on to our dreams is a way of staying true to the children that we once were. It's an inoculation against cynicism. And they say that at the end of our lives, we rarely, we often regret the things we didn't do, but we rarely regret the adventures that we had, even if they ended in failure. So what role does a teacher play in inspiring adventure? There's a lovely Irish poem by the Cork poet Michael Davitt called Moshter Scullah, in which the poet recalls the fantastic tales their teacher told them in third class. There were alligator adventures by the upper reaches of the lower Zambezi, shaking pepper in the eyes of a leopard. The poet says to the teacher, we believed you because we believed in you, knowing that the teacher told a bright truth rather than hard facts. So when I was a teenager, I realized that I actually had a deep love for the land and for farming. And I also had a teacher in secondary school who inspired a passionate interest in Africa. And I thought I would combine these two interests. I would study agricultural science and I would go off and save the world. Um, now, I was very conscious that you need to be careful who you share your dreams with, because even with the best of intentions, our loved ones and our not so loved ones will often try to steer us onto more safe paths if we look like we're going into risky ground. And about 20 years ago, I found I was cleaning out an old cupboard with my mother and we found a box of letters to my grandfather dating from the late 1890s. Among the letters, there were some from his sister who was a nun in Galveston, Texas. And he was obviously thinking about emigrating to America at the time. But her letters warn him <coughs> not to countenance such a notion. And she says it would grieve her sorely if he was to consider leaving home. She goes on to warn him about tales of you know, Irish who went to America and ended up in abject poverty and distress. She warns him that the weather is beyond endurance and he would not be able to stick it, even though in her heavy nun's garb, she didn't seem to have any problem. <laughs> and she also warns him that America was a godless place where he would doubtless lose his religion. So <laughs> now there will always be people like my grand aunt who warn us there be dragons if we want to head off the beaten path. But we can also get in our own way and create our own dragons. When I was thinking about going to Africa, there were two things that particularly made me nervous. One was spiders and creepy crawlies. <laughs> and the other was 
would I be any good? Did I have anything of value to offer to any project or any community? And self-doubt can be an awful creepy crawly. But somehow with the optimism of youth, you know, I made the phone calls and at the age of 23, I found myself heading off to Sudan with concern. About two weeks before I departed, I woke to the news on the radio of a bomb explosion in Khartoum. And all I could think of was, I hope Mammy doesn't hear about this. <laughs> <laughs> so I spent two years in Sudan and it was an awesome adventure. It was intoxicating, it was exotic, it was exhilarating. You know, there was the dry heat of the desert, caravans of camels, the Arabic language and culture, smell of sandalwood, incense, and the hot, sweet, spicy tea. I lived near the border with Eritrea in a place where nothing happened, but everything happened. I worked with semi-nomadic pastoralists where hospitality and graciousness were really hallmarks of civility among people who were as materially poor as anywhere I've ever witnessed. I slept out under the stars and I would gaze at the magnificence of the night sky and realize how tiny we are and how futile it is to sweat the small stuff. The spiders and the creepy crawlies did exist, but I found that I wasn't as scared of them as I had expected. And as for my other fear about whether I had anything to offer, I hoped that I did no harm. I learned a lot about the universality of human experience. I learned humility. I learned that technical solutions are not going to solve complex problems. And I also learned that the more we know, the more we know how little we know. Those two years in Sudan sparked a love affair with Africa and I subsequently went to work in Tanzania and spent more than 10 years there. Always exploring and learning that not every creepy crawly is out to get you. But I think, you know, and it's something from the other speakers as well today, that stretching ourselves, pushing ourselves outside our comfort zones seems to be necessary if we are to know who we truly are and if we are to become the people that we are capable of becoming. But you know, it's not enough just to have the experiences. How do we make sense of them? How do we take the meaning from them? And I was thinking about an incident that happened during the mid 90s when I was working in Tanzania. I was driving through a remote game reserve on my own uh, you know, one afternoon. I had passed in through a gate that nobody had used for the last five days. And it was about 20 kilometers to go to the lodge where I was going to stay. And after a few kilometers, it was raining, the road was very muddy, and my car slid down into a ditch. And I got out and assessed the situation and realized that there was nothing I could do except get back in the car and wait in the hope that I might be rescued. I was in a forested area, a lot of wild animals around. There was no point in even considering trying to walk back to the gate. Now, when I think back on that incident, what strikes me is that I wasn't scared. I was in a binary situation. I'd either get rescued or I wouldn't. And I had water, I had food in the car, and it wasn't cold. The night was drawing in, and I wasn't rescued for several hours. But during that time, I was acutely conscious of the African night. You know, I could hear the sounds of hyenas in the distance, I could hear lions roaring, and I was very present to what was happening. Now, if I had had a mobile phone, I think that experience would have been so much different and so much poorer, that we actually have to be as present to the experiences that we have. Now, fear of failure can stop us from doing a lot of things. Fear of failure can stop us from trying things that are new. Our education system does not reward failure. And I think we need to rewire our brains to see failure as acceptable. You know, to fall, to get up again, to fall again, to get up again. And as Colin said earlier, and as Beckett said, to fail better. It's the way we learn to walk as toddlers. Each time we fell, we got up, 
and we brought something to the next attempt. There's a story that you might have heard about an eagle chick that is hatched out by a farmyard, a domestic hen. And the, chick, the eagle chick grows up thinking it is farmyard fowl, scratching around in the yard. One day it looks up and it sees an eagle flying overhead and thinks, wow, wouldn't it be fantastic to soar like that, if that's the way eagles think. <laughs> <laughs> but then it goes back to scratching around the yard and spends, she spends her whole life without ever attempting to fly. So in some way, are we eagles that have been too domesticated? Fear of failing in front of other people, fear of being judged as incompetent or being seen as beginners can be very, very powerful. At the age of 49, I started a new adventure, which is a career as an academic. And as academics, publish or perish is the mantra. We are judged on our published research. And this is a real struggle for me as a late starter. It's a mountain that I have to climb. And last year, I had submitted an article to a particular journal and it was rejected. And when I got the, the email, it took me a week before I was able to open the critique of the paper because rejection does hurt. But we can get over it, we can face it. And I think that you know, while we might stand on the shoulders of giants, we build our foundations on the rubble of our mistakes. One of the things I would like to take to my students is this idea that it is better to aim high and fail than to lower the bar and achieve mediocrity. But it does not matter from where or when you start. In one of my previous lives, I had the privilege of doing some work on uh, basic adult education and adult literacy and met some fantastic people who went back to learn the basics as adults. And like all ad adult education is an adventure. But I think for people who have you know, left, been failed by the education system, left school very often thinking that they're the bottom of the class, they had some serious creepy crawlies from their past experience to face down. But having faced them, nothing else has ever been really daunting since. So I think when we realize how little we know and how short life is. It makes for an exciting prospect to give meaning to our lives. Helen Keller, the great activist, once said that life is either a great adventure or nothing. So in concluding this talk, I want to challenge all of us to push ourselves outside the comfort zone, to take risks, to choose roads that are less taken. And maybe to embrace the spiders that scare us. And a call to action that I would put to you is to do something that scares you. Whether that something is picking up the phone to somebody, a friend or a sibling that you've been estranged from, whether it's applying for a new job, whether it's taking on a course that you find daunting. We need to say to our inner creepy crawly, hello, old friend, I can see you but I'm going to do it anyway. Thank you. <laughs>